Good morning, everyone. It's January 26th. I'm not sure where January has gone, but now we're into the last week of January and this full first full month of the year. So time, as always, is flying. But January is a great time to talk about supplier segmentation, and that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Why it's important to look at your supply base, really carve them up, dig into that, understand what's there and where your money is going and where the risk is. So this is our dynamic dialogue webinar series. We're doing this bi-weekly now on the second and fourth Tuesday of every month. We start at 11.30 a.m. Pacific. We go for about an hour and then you have your day back. So this link is new for January to March and it will be good through March. So. Thank you for all of you who have signed up and registered and for all of you who attend uh, in person, I appreciate that, but I know there are many of you who can't make these live and that's great. That's why I record them and send them out to you. So you will get the slides and you will get the recording of this for those of you who have signed up. This is, um, again, this link is good for now through March and I appreciate and take all thoughts, challenges, ideas, questions, suggestions for topics, whatever you have on your mind. So let's talk about supplier segmentation. Supplier segmentation is a process and it's to group suppliers into different categories and they can be in multiple categories. It's to help you focus the resources of your department to manage your supply base and to make sure that you're getting the most value from your supply base. It's called segmentation because it, it, um, that's one of the words that is used. It's classification, categorization. There's many words that you can use for this activity. But what it is, is really looking at the supply base and looking at what matters to your company. There are several different approaches. The most common and the most traditional is a historical spend analysis. And that's a great place to start. That is a good thing to do. It's always important to know where your money is going. But it's also important to look at where your money is going to go in the next year and the two years and three years after that. Because what you did last year may reflect very closely what you do this year, but it may not. For instance, if you have products that are end of lifing, if you have new products that you're introducing, your spend could be way different with different suppliers. If you have new things that you're adding or if you're changing your product design, that can be a big deal. If you're gonna split off some of your business or if you get an acquisition, that can change a lot from last year to this year. And as we all know and are still painfully aware of, we had a pandemic last year. And so the historical 2020 numbers may not be as valuable to some organizations as the 2019 numbers, because that may be more representative of what you expect to get to during this year. If your business changed radically because of the pandemic, then your spend between 2019 and 2020 could look very different. And you need to understand where you are with that against the 2021 spend and the 2022 spend. So I always recommend doing this exercise in January because I think it's a good way to kind of start the new year. Many companies end their fiscal year in December. And so this is a great way to start the fiscal year. But even if you don't, if, if, even if this isn't the start of a fiscal year, it's important to take a look and this is a good time to, to kind of clean that slate and look forward. You, some companies look at categories and commodities. They divide their suppliers into different groups based on the category or commodity that they provide to the customer. Sometimes you look at suppliers by region. That may be very important now when we look at what's going to be happening in the next year with trade relations between various countries. I know a lot of companies were surprised at how much product came from China if it was indirect, maybe not directly from there and they have decided that they would like to reduce their footprint in China or maybe in Asia, or maybe there's an area that you would like to increase your footprint in and then getting more suppliers in that area could be a good thing. And then some, 
some companies and many companies look at the performance. And this is an important area. So even if you have suppliers that are have a lot of spend, if their performance is poor, that's probably costing you more money than you would like it to. So on top of the spend that's heavy that you've determined, if they have poor performance and delivery and quality, if res in responsiveness, if your relationships aren't good with them, then that can cost you even more money. So I suggest that you look at supplier segmentation from a holistic, from a broad perspective and include all of these things. And I also caution my clients and companies to say, you want to look at what's recurring spend, not one-time purchases. You may have bought something from a supplier that was very expensive and maybe it was a piece of equipment, but you're not going to buy that again. Now you may look at the maintenance and the re repair parts and spare parts you want to buy as part of this activity. But you really want to look at those suppliers that you have recurring spend with, those that you are going to continue to use in some way, shape, or form this year, next year, and the year after that. So if it has very limited time frame on it, it may not be as valuable for this exercise. But it's good to know that, and then you can remove those suppliers. So the rationale is sort of like the sorting hat from Harry Potter. You really want to look at which one goes in which bucket. So if you remember the Harry Potter, they said Gryffindor or Slytherin or Hufflepuff, and you got put into a house that was put into supposedly with like-minded people with each of these students. So what we're trying to do with our suppliers is just that. We're trying to analyze which suppliers are in which groups. So we know where to put our resources. We know what activities and tasks are associated with that supplier. And we know what management support there is or there is needed for those particular suppliers. We want to separate the critical few from the trivial many because many, supply, many companies have more suppliers than they can handle. And that's true. But it's good to look at those and see which are the ones you're not using very much, which are the ones that really don't make the grade, if you will, when you start to do the analysis and looking at that. And what can you do about them? If you have a lot of tail spend with a, a few suppliers, can you take that tail spend and use that with existing suppliers, suppliers that you have more spend with, because that gives you more leverage and more uh, credence and more a better relationship with them. This exercise will help you identify gaps and look for risks and opportunities. So where there's risk, there's usually opportunity. And if you want to identify that risk before you actually encounter it, that's a good thing. Then you can put mitigation in place. Then you can hopefully avoid a lot of that. This also helps you get a common context and language to speak about your suppliers to the rest of your organization. When you have these categories and everyone understands what they mean, then when you say this supplier belongs in this category, that sends a message to the rest of the organization that doesn't necessarily have a positive or a negative connotation. It just says, this is where this supplier fits into our supply base. Now there is one category that is do not do business with. And if you have a supplier in there, that sends a very, uh, strong message to your to your internal stakeholders that this one has been uh, X'd from our supply base for these reasons. But again, you still have that common foundation for that. If you want to implement a preferred or recommended supplier program, which is a very good way to do uh, to do supplier acknowledgement, to build supplier relationships, and to funnel more business to those suppliers. That's a good thing to do. That, that activity starts with this activity. You want to make sure you achieve your goals and objectives for the year, and you want to make sure you include services as well as goods purchased, again, if they're repeating. So the criteria you start with, I say the last six to 12 months worth of spend, this year, I would say if you have the spend for 2020 and maybe in the second half of that might be a little more um, relevant because the first half we got is when COVID hit and things started happening, but you need to look at that for whatever works with your company. And then I also say really look at 2019 spend, the, this pre-COVID spend, even if you just take the last six months of 2019, or even maybe the last quarter of 2019, the first quarter of 2020, since we really got into pandemic mode in about March of last year.
you want to look at the spend by supplier, of course. Where are you spending money? But you also want to look at it by this category, commodity, which ones am I buying sheet metal parts from, plastic parts, pumps, whatever your c categories or commodities. Maybe it's, um, maybe it's silver, maybe it's copper, or whatever your category or commodity is. You want to look at look at it by product family, because you probably have some products that have higher volume, make more money for your company, and you wanna really emphasize the suppliers that are involved with those really important products to your company. You also wanna look at products that may be phasing out and what suppliers are in those, are related to those products, because that might be something that you wanna be able to convey to the supplier that this product is phasing out. So my business is going away. So maybe we can replace that. Maybe you can't, but you want to let them know. And you also want to look at new products because if you have new products that are launching in this year, you're going to have extra spend in those areas with those suppliers above and beyond what you had last year. So if you have a brand new supplier that was making parts for a product that's going to be introduced this year sometime, you may have only had spend that related to some prototypes or some development work. But by the time you launch that product and get it up to production, it, this, the spend bait may be significantly more and you want to account for that now in your projections. You also want to look at the suppliers that you buy high dollar items from. You may not buy a lot of them, but you may they may be very expensive. So if you have a lot of parts that are between 10 and say $100, and then you have a couple of parts that you buy, and again, buy them repetitively, that are $1,000 or more, that's going to make that supplier more valuable to your company and present more potential risk. So even if that total spend isn't a lot, because you only buy a few of those, <clears throat> if you continue to buy that, that's important. You want to look out and project out for the next six to 18 months. With COVID, you want to look at what's in the short run because we still have a lot of that. A lot of companies are projecting to be in, I'll say, COVID mode or pandemic response mode through the summer, maybe into Q3 uh, calendar-wise, and then maybe Q4, October, November, and December will look different. So whatever your company assesses the situation to be, that's what you want to look at. And you can project out for between now and say September, and then look at October through next year if you want to do projections that way. You want to look for what products you buy that are custom versus off the shelf. If you're buying your supplier's product that has their IP in it, their design, their patents, their their, their model of something, that's different than if you're having them make something for you custom. So the amount of money you spend may be relatively different. For example, if you're an electronics company and you buy a lot of things from, say, Granger, so you might buy a lot of things there, but it's probably from a lot of different manufacturers, a lot of different types of things there, and they're all off-the-shelf items. So that spend is important to you because you're spending a lot of it, but you're spending probably on many different parts and they're lower dollar parts and they're readily available from several other organizations. You could either buy them direct or you could buy them from an arrow or another uh, competitor. So they're, when they're readily available, that makes the, the okay. risk less, which is great, which Did makes- snack? So I'm going to snack. So you want to look at these things. You want to re, uh, look at the long lead time. I know during the pandemic, lead times have almost doubled for a lot of companies and from the suppliers, from the manufacturers. And if that's the case, then you want to consider that. Because if you have long lead time parts, maybe they were eight to 10 weeks, and now you're seeing them 15 to 20 weeks, that's a big impact. That's something you want to look at from your company perspective to say, what do we do about that? You also want to look at situations like they're seeing in the auto industry now when the chips are in short supply. So I don't know how expensive the chips are, but relative to maybe a motor, these chips are not very expensive, even though there are a lot of them. But when they're in short supply, that's an important aspect that you want to consider. I also look for suppliers that have 
my equipment. So if I've built expensive tools like a plastic tool, a plastic mold, and that's at your supplier and they're using that, that's an important supplier. If they're using your tool, that makes them more important than if you're buying it, say an off the shelf piece of plastic from them. Where, they, where you have your tools, your equipment and any consigned material, that's an important area to look at. So you wanna look at more than spend. You wanna look at, first of all, I say technology. If you have a supplier that has prior, um, leading edge technology, bleeding edge technology, and you went to that supplier because of that technology, that makes them more important, even again, if the spend is not very much. And this may be something that you wanna look at now and in the future, because this may be for a new product or a product that you're anticipating. And you wanna look at how they manage their technology, even if they're ordinary parts. So technology can mean, are they upgrading their equipment? Are they maintaining their equipment? Are they keeping everything up to date and moving forward as well as their competitors? Some companies may be tending to lag. They may have had plans to spend money last year on capital products, capital equipment, newer machines that they did not do because of COVID. So that may be allowable, but if that's been put off for four or five years, then their equipment could be moving them to a place where they're not as competitive. So look at their technology. Quality is very important. Their quality processes are just as important, if not more important than the quality of the parts that you receive. A lot of companies focus on the quality they receive and they say, oh, I haven't had any problems from that supplier. Oh, that's good. But do they really have the processes, the know-how, and is that ingrained in their organization? Those are the things you want to look at for the suppliers that you're to make them higher tiered. If you have risk in this area, uh, if you have done a supplier visit or you've seen some evidence of them not having the quality or you've seen an erosion in the quality, then that's a red flag and you want to be aware of that and you want to include that in your risk analysis. Responsiveness. This is an area that's really important, I think, and some because it's harder to measure, it's more of a subjective item than objective. Some companies dismiss it and say it's not important, but it is to me because I want them to have the same search of same sense of urgency that my company does. When something is really important to me, I want it to be important to my supplier that's involved with that. If it's just a, I have an issue, I have a question, whatever, I still want them to be responsive and treat me as a valued customer. If I'm always waiting for them to respond to my, my inquiry, my request, my email, my phone call, if I'm not getting the communication responses that I need, that's important. And if their team isn't performing when you say this is a big deal to me and they're not making it a big deal to them, then you want to look at that supplier and say, why is that? That may be a chance to go work on your relationship. It may be a chance to go find another supplier, or it may be just a chance to increase their understanding of what is important to your company. Delivery, of course, is important, and delivery is one of those things I always say is very hard to measure, but you want to have parts in-house because any part missing means your line is going to stop, and that's a very bad thing, but you don't want to have too much inventory either, so especially with COVID, especially with the pandemic and the lead times doubling in many areas, you want to look at how is their delivery performance, how are you working with them to improve that delivery performance because it may be that all of your lead times in your system are less now than what you're actually experiencing. And you want to look at what you're experiencing as well as what they're quoting. They may be quoting a four-week lead time, but if it's taking you six weeks to get things, then you want to change that in your system and make sure that you're ordering on time in order to get your parts on time. Cost, always, always, always important. But in these times, we want to look especially at total cost and not just at unit price. A lot of parts and a lot of commodities and categories of parts went up last year for a variety of reasons. Some of those actually costs went down in some areas and some costs were all over the place. There were extra charges for things. There was more expedite cost involved. There was more freight cost because you had to do something different. So you want to look at that total package of what's happening with the cost 
one of my clients told me that they had a supplier that every time they went to order a part and they ordered it kind of repetitively every four to six weeks, every time the supplier wanted to give them a new quote and change the price. So if you don't have long-term contracts in place, that's a good opportunity to go try to get that in place because you want to be able to have a consistent, predictable cost in your cost model so you know what is your profit margins are going to be. Some companies are not good business fit. Some companies experienced a huge impact to their finances last year and now are very financially unstable. That is maybe not a good business fit for your company. You, as your company, may have experienced the same thing with some financial issues and your suppliers may be telling you that you as a customer are not a good fit for them, especially if you had some trouble making payroll or doing some things, uh, making payments in time. Uh, if you had delayed payments to them or they had to call and argue to get their payments made, then you may have some issues. There are other business fits with how much leverage you have. If you're doing, if you're a smaller business and you're doing business with a huge behemoth, that may not be a good fit. Vice versa, if you're a very big company and you're working with uh, mom and pop shops that are very small, that may not be a good business fit. You have to look at what works for you. And this description of this is important to every company. And finally, social responsibility is now on everyone's radar, whether it's around uh, sustainability and economic, uh, ec ecological fit, uh, whether it's diversity and inclusion that companies are fitting into, whether it's giving enough back to other organizations and uh, being more community involvement, it's many different things to many different companies. Look at what is important to your company in terms of social responsibility, and then look at how that fits with your suppliers. If you're diametrically opposed, then that's not a very good way to do that. If it it's a big deal to your company, <coughs> excuse me, and your supplier says, we don't really care about that, that may not be a good long-term fit either. So check the fit and see how you work with your suppliers. Here's a little more detail on that that you can use. Um, you can look at that at your leisure. So I like to put suppliers into three categories and then two exception categories. So most of the suppliers go into three categories. <coughs> Excuse me. Those categories are strategic, core, and basic. Now you can call these anything you want. Strategic suppliers, some companies call them critical suppliers or tier one. Core suppliers are the ones that are in the middle and the basic suppliers are also called standard or transactional or whatever. So the strategic suppliers have typically most of the financial value around maybe 80% of your spend would go with these strategic suppliers. But the basic suppliers is going to have the most suppliers in that bucket. So your highest number of suppliers is going to be in the bottom tier. In the core area, you're really looking at those that aren't quite making the cut to be strategic but they're more than the standard or the basic suppliers. They're ones that you really wanna keep an eye on. They can be ones that are new suppliers that don't have the amount of spend yet, but you expect to see that in the next year. They may be ones that just have some tools that you wanna look out for or whatever the risk is that you identified to put them in there or the issue is that you put them in that category. And again, this is unique to every company. You have a few that you say do not do business with, and sometimes that's we, we're stuck on this contract, we're stuck on this product, but we're not giving them anything else. So they are in your system to say really don't use them. They may be a supplier that you no longer do business with, that you did business with before, even if it was for a long time, but now you've chosen not to do that. Unfortunately, that may be some of these suppliers with the financial risk that I identified from the pandemic. If, they, if you don't think they're going to make it through the next year, you may have cut your business off with them, whether it's cut clean or phasing that out. You have to look at what works for your company. And then on the top, I say these are the custom, these are the alliance. These usually have multidimensional relationships which means it may be a supplier that's also a customer. 
It may be a supplier that's also a competitor uh, or also sells to your competitor. So you want to be careful about that. I know in my experience, when I was working from the corporate world, I had a couple of suppliers, uh, oftentimes like a, a PCA, PCB supplier that made circuit boards for us, but they also made circuit boards for uh, my competition. So we wanted to make sure our circuit boards were segregated from theirs and that the two teams were different that worked on those and that when that when my competition came in, they, they couldn't get a sneak peek at what our boards looked like and vice versa, uh, that we wanted to make sure they were protecting our competition so that we couldn't look at that because we knew that if they treated us like that, they would treat them the same way. So you can have these relationships that are a little bit tricky that you're buying things from as a supplier, but you also have other things. They can also be directed sources where your customer says you will use this supplier, um, or it may be a supplier that you just have to have a lot of investment into. You, you've done a lot with tools or equipment or whatever. So there's always a supplier or two that's in this category when your company gets big enough and, and diverse enough to do some different things. If you don't have any for a while, that's not a problem. And if you don't have any do not do business with, that's not a problem. Focus on the other categories. You will have, ca you will have suppliers in each of those three middle categories, strategic, core, and basic. And the final determination factors, I say, are really easy to kind of look at when you look at the two different axes. You look at spend and you look at strategic importance. So a lot of companies do the spend analysis and they spend a lot of time with that and that's all they do. So as I say, I feel like the spend analysis is a good place to start, but you can't stop. You have to go deeper and different than that in order to really get a handle on your supply base. So you want to look at the strategic importance and you can call this a couple different things, um, risk factors, strategic importance, uh, impact, uh, value to your company, but you're looking at the impacts, the risk, the value. You're looking at this in, a, um, in an ideal way as a cross-functional exercise, which means you're looking at that with the quality stakeholders, with the financial stakeholders, with your engineering stakeholders, your technical people, looking at these suppliers to say, who's important to us for what? Um, and you want to look at the product lifecycle position, as I've said a couple of times, is this a supplier that's up and coming and bringing new influence into your spend through their product lifecycle being de a development supplier? Or is this a supplier that you're phasing that product out and you're not going to be using anymore? So you want to look at all the activities you're doing with the suppliers and where they fit into your, um, into your company. So the strategic suppliers are the ones typically with high spend and strategic importance. If they have a high amount of strategic importance um, and high spend, they automatically go into strategic. If they have strategic importance, but not so much spend, they can still be strategic if that's where you want to put them. Or sometimes that's where they fall in, these, in this custom category, which is the, uh, the special category. It doesn't often go there, but it could. Then you want to look at the standard ones, which are all the transactional ones, the ones where you buy standard off the shelf. You go to a catalog and you purchase your parts. Low spend typically um, and low strategic importance. Uh, these are the ones that have lots of substitutes uh, and you can easily find another. They have lots of competition. You can find another supplier to do this for you. And then the key ones are kind of in the middle. They may be high spend or high risk, uh, and they may be of strategic importance. So there is no exact science to, to this, but you want to kind of use this as a guideline as to where they are in the spend and where they are in your strategic importance. Um, you want to look at the ways to use this. So once you determine what these suppliers are, then you say, OK, why is this important and why have I talked now for half an hour about why you need to do this? The reason is, first, every company is always looking at cost reductions. I've never seen a company who says we don't really care about cost reductions. I've seen 
companies who say cost is not our number one priority. We have other things that are more important, but if we can get a cost reduction, then we're going to take it. So it's, it varies in where it is in the hierarchy, but it's never, never mind, we don't care. Everyone cares about cost reductions. So segmentation helps you look at this from, again, a broader perspective, a total cost perspective. It also starts to help you look at the direct cost, the material, labor, inventory, the carrying costs of that part. If you're looking at the indirect costs, what does it cost you to manage that supplier? I talked about responsiveness as one of the criteria that I use. And I always asked my commodity managers and my category managers, where are you spending your time? Which suppliers are you spending your time with? And then take a step back and say, where should you be spending your time? So if you have suppliers that you're spending a lot of time with on trying to improve their performance, fix something, get them to work better for you. These are what it costs your support staff. And if those are not suppliers that are as critical through this exercise, then you got to say, where, how can I fix this? You don't want to be spending a lot of your, your time, especially your top talented resources on suppliers that fall into this standard kind of category, into this lower area. You don't, that's not where, why you're paying these people higher dollars. You want to be looking at those, have them spending their time with the suppliers that are the most important to you. And then inventory reduction is an issue right now as well. So you want to look at the, the inventory status in terms of your suppliers. Where is your excess inventory? What suppliers did that come from? Is there something that you can do about that? And can you prevent that from happening even more from exacerbating that situation? Or can you prevent that with happening with other suppliers through what you've learned on that? So find out what works for you. Risk is the other element that we're looking at. It's been highlighted about tenfold through the pandemic. Assurance of supply is always, always, always important. So if you have a supplier and you're trying to understand why the performance isn't good, then look at that in terms of, again, in your classification. If you have suppliers that are strategic, but you say, wow, these guys are not performing, then that's a double problem for you. It's a cost issue because that's where you're spending your money, but it's also a risk issue because you have a lot of suppliers uh, that aren't performing. So look at those things. You want to look at succession planning, business continuity, again, financials of your suppliers. What is the risk of that? Where is that? How does that relate to your company? Compliance, always important, and we are getting ever more compliance requirements. Right now, there's more responsibility and more requests for companies to be, uh, to put in protocols for the pandemic. If your suppliers are much looser than your company is about the pandemic, that may not be a good fit. That may be exacerbated risk. If your company is requiring social distancing, masks, and, and protections to your workers, and yet they're not requiring that for the suppliers aren't doing that, then that's a problem and you want to address that. Um, vice versa, if your suppliers have a lot more protocols than you do, you might say, what's going on here and why is this a different? It may be something that you can live with, or it may be something <clears throat> that you want to raise to your company and say, you know, our suppliers are a lot more careful about this. Maybe we should be looking at this as well. Location, again, uh, we're looking at uh, suppliers that are located in Asia, in um, South America, uh, Mexico, there's a lot of different locations that are either prioritized or deprioritized through events in the last year. And then where are your resource dependencies? Who has a, which supplier has a technical staff that's very important or has a one person technical staff? I know through, I worked for some high tech companies and we liked suppliers that had some cutting edge um, technology if they had that technology and it was only one person in the company that had it, maybe the owner, the founder built it on his or her technology, then that's a dependency that you want to be aware of. 
Financial dependencies right now are a big deal. Companies have lent their suppliers money. They've extended payment terms uh, in the way that they're paying down payments with purchase orders. They have um, increased payment time so that it used to be say net 45 and now they're paying in net 30 or even net 20 or 15 because the supplier needed that. So where are those risks? And look at it both from the customer side and the supplier side, because if your customers have a lot of risk as well, you want to make sure that you're not overextending yourself to do what your customer needs done. Cost reductions are another important one. We talked about this a little bit. The, the, I like Einstein a lot. I admire him. And a couple things that he has said I use probably over and over and over. Uh, and I'm not sure he actually said this, but it sounds like an Einstein thing. Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So that has been classified as insanity or crazy. But if you're doing the same thing and, and expecting a different result, it's not going to happen. But the other thing I really like that I think Einstein actually said is not everything that matters can be measured or I say can be measured easily and not everything that can be measured matters. So look at what your suppliers are doing what, and what you're doing. How are you measuring suppliers? How are they measuring themselves? And do those line up? Also, again, cost reductions are important. You might be able to do some things through identifying them as a potential for cost reduction through your segmentation exercise. And you want to say, okay, do I need a new source, a different source? Should I go back and look at price breaks because I've doubled my spend with them in the last year? Um, or maybe they're, I'm afraid they're going to give me a price increase because my spend with them has been cut in half since, 19, since 2019. Or what are the issues there? So you want to say what's going on. So you want to look at direct costs. They, these are the primary target for reductions. This is what companies count. They count direct cost reductions. Even though I feel that it's important to count cost avoidances, a lot of companies don't do that and they don't report that. They say usually because it doesn't hit the bottom line, but the cost reductions that most department heads um, tout and advertise to their peers don't usually reflect what's in the financial numbers anyway, because we project in procurement, we project forward and say, I just saved $10 on this. I'm, I, I'm forecast to buy a thousand of them. That's a $10,000 savings. That's a future savings. And, fu and finance says, I don't see it because I haven't bought those thousand units yet. And I don't know what else is going up in the next year. So they don't often match anyway. So I like to count cost avoidances, but you have to look at that. Still, the primary target is going to be the direct cost. But there are other costs. Uh, these costs of quality, delivery, responsiveness, technology, communication, all the things I've been talking about that help you rate suppliers, these things cost money too when they're not working well. So through this exercise, that gives you a chance to say, okay, here's my opportunity to improve this. And that's going to improve the productivity of my staff. That's going to improve the quality that we see on the floor, less scrap, less rework, less returns, less sorting, whatever those things are. Um, and maybe if we identify technology, we're going to get some better equipment processes, or I can move parts from one supplier to another that has those better equipment and better processes. Our resources have been stretched to the limit with COVID. All across the world, people have felt this impact. People are still working from home. People are not having the same relationships. They've been assigned to different um, projects and interim work. Some people are picking up the slack. Some people have lost their jobs. So there's so many different things that you want to look at. It's really important that you take time and go look at your suppliers and say, okay, this is what I have to work with from here forward. What are we going to do? How are we going to manage that? And then be always aware of surprises. What is there that you didn't anticipate? So shortages, look at the shortages you have and you have had over the last six months. Look at any forecast shortages that you have and what can you do about those?
Again, supplier financial instability is a big deal. It's going to be a big deal as we get through this year and see how some of these businesses manage to get through the pandemic or don't. And then um, the, we've talked, you, you, you hear talk about economic downturns, you hear talk about things picking up. If, um, again, I've talked about the chip shortage. If the chip shortage is down, then companies aren't making as many cars. If you're in the automobile industry and you're making parts for cars, just because you can make everything they want, if they can't ship the number that they want, and I think it was Ford that shut down actually for a week, um, the second week of this month, the week of the 11th, because they didn't have enough chips, then they may slow you down too. So if they slow your, your suppliers down, then how does that manage? And how are you going to manage those kinds of things in your company? As a customer, you have to manage if you don't have parts, you don't want to keep everybody building at a rate that one of your suppliers can't match. You don't want to turn them off but you and you don't want to run out of those parts in three months because now all of a sudden the chips are flowing in and you need other parts that other suppliers make. So it's a very difficult thing to balance. So what I know is that a focused approach is the most productive. Be purposeful in looking at your suppliers. Be honest with yourselves about the risk and the potential of each of your suppliers. Proactive action and proactively looking at these suppliers is a lot better than waiting till these surprises and these things hit you in the head. Uh, look at your supplier relationships. If you have poor supplier relationships, then you really need to look at, is it worth my time and effort to go fix that? If those poor supplier relationships are in that core or standard category or the lower end, the standard category, then it's probably not worth it. It's probably easier to get another supplier and just keep moving on. If those are with the core or the strategic areas, your relationships aren't good, then you wanna fix those. So figure out what it takes to fix that versus what it takes to move that or try to get a new supplier. Often it's much easier to repair a relationship than it is to get a new supplier. So assess where you are. You want to obtain the value from your supply base and you want to do the things that are best for your company. So look at not only the rip risks and the challenges, but look at the opportunities with your current suppliers. See where you can make more progress this year with your supply base. Remember, this segregation, this classification provides a good framework for the entire organization get some key stakeholders to do this with you. That way, everyone's prioritizing the same. Suppliers, they understand the strengths and the weaknesses of the suppliers and why they're there. And when you're awarding business, look to the core and the strategic suppliers to give the business to, make them preferred if they warrant that, and funnel more business to the suppliers that you know that you can count on because that's gonna keep your business moving forward through 2021 and beyond. So that's what I have today, our dynamic dialogue webinars upcoming uh, for February 9th. We're gonna talk about skill enhancement for every work environment. Companies are working from home much longer than they anticipated that. They may have a few dollars now to spend for development if they got a new fiscal year and they have some money for employee development, employee training. I'm going to talk about some ways you can do that and develop your skills, of the, develop the skills of the staff that you have or decide when to augment that with additional people. We're going to talk about business continuity on the 23rd of February. That's business continuity with your own organization and with your suppliers, what to look for in your supplier business continuity. In, on March 9th, I'm going to talk about organizational maturity of supply chains and why some supply chains, some organizations do really well with the small staff and why others have large staff trying to do things and they're just not doing very well. You can check out these and more on our website, purplelink.net.
And if you're interested in more discussion on how to make this work with your team, you can always do a 30 minute call with Jane. It's completely free. You just go to callwithjane.com and it will take you to my calendar and you can pick some time to meet with me and review what challenges are in your business. So if you don't have a good support system, this is a great way for you to do that. I'm going to be doing a CPSM exam two class starting in March 15th. We had a little bit of a delay there and there's some more workshops I'm working on for the spring. And I want to leave you with this final note is um, business thought of the day number three. I don't know who's number three that is, but knowing where to look can unlock fortunes in business. So when you're looking at your suppliers, knowing where and how to look at them, you really can find a lot of opportunity to improve the, your business while you're working with these other businesses. So with that, I'll take questions, comments, whatever. I'll open up the, the mics. You can unmute yourself and ask questions or you can use the chat room.